Uh, good afternoon, judges. Good afternoon, IC. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, I'm Ahan. Uh, me along with my peers, Eric and Ryan from Dartmouth, uh, would like to pitch the stock Daniel. Um, after conducting a DCF analysis, we found that the upside was 29.5%, and therefore we have a strong bad position. Uh, to contextualize, uh, Daniel is a leading global life sciences and diagnostics innovator committed to accelerating the power of science and technology. Um, and essentially, we have three main thesis points. The first one being that uh, Danaher has driven consistent shareholder value creation uh, thanks to his acquisition driven compounding. Um, this is complemented by the efficacy of, this, of DBS, which is its Danaher business system uh, predicated upon the Japanese principles of Kaizen. Um, and lastly, they're really robust scientific innovation and strategic partnerships. Um, ultimately, this, is, this has been further propelled by its IP generation, which is definitely one of its key modes. Um, and the company has consistently reinvented itself through DBS, which enables it to acquire and integrate acquisitions and therefore improve the performance of key targets. Um, and I, I'll talk about this later on as well, but over the last decade, their recurring revenues have skyrocketed as well, uh, therefore making it a very uh, stable and profitable stock to buy. Moving on to the business overview, Danaher's business overview strategy is really based on the Kaizen principles, which is based on cutting costs, improving efficiency, and um, continuous improvement. They operate in three main business segments, with their fourth being environmental solutions, which was recently spun off into a separate company called Veralto in the beginning of Q4. Their three main business segments are biotechnology, life sciences, and diagnostics. And as a whole, they own and operate around 38 various firms. As we can see with the geographic distribution, they're um, attempting at diversifying in high growth and developing markets. There are four main macro and industry trends that we think will benefit uh, Danaher in the years coming. The first is the decentralization of healthcare. So basically, you know, hospitals and research labs are diversifying where they're getting their instruments and products from. They're really, really trying to look for cheaper prices. And we think Danaher can really capitalize on this because they offer very innovative products at cheap prices. Um, second is general healthcare trends. Um, they have a lot of their market, almost 50% in developing and high growth markets. And we think that this is going to drive revenue growth in the coming years. Um, the third is just the general growth in the genomics and the biological R&D market. You know, this is going to be a future of healthcare. Danaher is investing very heavily into it. And we see, you know, a compound annual growth rate of, you know, 50% in the past years, and it's going to continue to grow in the future. And finally, they're really focusing on automation, which allows them to reduce costs, really focus on those Kaizen business principles, um, and achieve a high growth rate um, in things like AI augmented imaging and flow cytosis. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I'll now talk about some of the sell side sentiment um, and kind of contextualize why we believe that uh, concerns about the company are unwarranted, at least in the future. Uh, We've we've seen sell side analysis from J.P. Morgan, Raymond James, and UBS, um, each of whom have expressed significant concern about China's detrimental bioprocessing decline this year. Um, for example, J.P. Morgan talked, spoke about how um life sciences in particular underformed expectations. Uh, J.P. Morgan's IB department has a thirty three percent underweight position. Um, and this has further been compounded by the fact that uh P consensus consensus estimates have declined by nearly a quarter of their value, um, for the first quarter of twenty twenty four. Uh, expected. That being said, we've conducted firstly a quantitative analysis, uh, which finds that the company has consistently remained high quality over not just not, not just right now, but over the past five years. Uh, we see that they're like, for example, right now, um uh, within the top four percent of companies by quality and are extremely low vol uh, low volatility as well. Um, as Ryan will talk about later, uh, their ESG quotient is pretty strong as well, uh, making it uh, another very valuable investment. Furthermore, we've looked at uh some key ratios which prove that the company has done uh, well and kind of justifies our contrarian view uh, against what analysts believe is um, Chinese uh, the, the Chinese bioprocessing decline. Um, ultimately, we believe that the China risk is overblown um, and the company lo uh, looks to improve its metrics uh, in all vectors and therefore is just for investment. Uh, and I'll speak about our first th main thesis point, which is that uh, Danaher's acquisition-driven compounding has propelled growth uh, and will continue, continue to do so um, in the years and months to come. Uh, historically, the company, it was founded in 1984, it's 40 years old, and it has completely emphasized high, high margin acquisitions. Uh, we see this historically from acquisitions of uh, companies ranging from Leica, uh, Biosystems, to AppCam and Aldevron. Um, and these companies each tend to have high gross margins, low SG&A costs, and high asset intensity. 
Um, total shareholder revenue has been completely optimized by Danaher's commitment to buying companies with higher margins. This makes it easier for the Danaher business system uh, to weed out costs and inefficiencies um, that are redundant. Uh, overall, it's, clearly, it's, it's quite clear that the company has significantly outperformed the S&P 500 of the past 25 years. Um, and it's quite clear the company is astute in purchasing other firms with, uh, which are criminally undervalued in the markets. Um, this is seen from the, from the graph here, which shows uh, how uh, around 10 of their most recent uh, and most profitable investments have done uh, with regard to their EV to gross assets ratio. Um, for companies like Abcam and Leica, they've nearly doubled or tripled the EV to gross assets ratio. And we see that the gross business return as a whole has been over 10% for a lot of these companies. Um, and therefore, we believe that the aggressive M&A um, of Danaher has enabled it to enter a range of diverse industries. Uh, furthermore, uh, a recent research re research report uh, in conjunction with JP Morgan showed that uh, Danaher is exi exiting 2023 with significantly higher M&A capa capacity than before. Um, in 2020, just post-COVID and the acquisition of Citiva Biosystems, um, the net debt to EBITDA was 2.5x. Um, that's reduced to less than 2x today, which means that M&A potential is much more. So the second thesis is, you know, just in general, their, their, their DBS system and how that, you know, allows them to really, really innovate and to really lean down to, you know, uh, focus on margin and profitability. So the first is a decentralized operational structure. They basically acquire companies that have high margin. They really, really try to, you know, increase that even more, really lean it down, reduce, you know, manufacturing costs, reduce, you know, as you can see uh, in the graph on the right, um, you know, like general administrative costs, increase margins, even even further and they reinvest that money into R&D and marketing to get their product out there to innovate even more and they basically allow their sub companies to sort of do their own thing really to innovate um, with agility and small scale to create the best products for the consumers right I, we think that this is good for all stakeholders and all parties right for shareholders you're getting higher margins more profitability more in, in return on capital invested um for the workers there, you're getting higher retention rates, you're getting higher pay, you're getting a lot of satisfaction. For the customers, you're really getting the best product um, with, with, you know, very efficient delivery um, and, and, you know, fast delivery. Um, and for the environment, you know, it's also good. They have great environmental and ESG goals. They aim to reduce emissions in total by 50% um, over the next 10 years, which is absolutely amazing. Thanks, Ryan. Our final thesis goes to um, <clears throat> Danaher's R&D, which is driven by some strategic partnerships. First off, they partnered and helped found the IGI, which is the Innovative Genomics Institute. This is led with by some Nobel laureates at UC Berkeley and has propelled CRISPR-based gene editing cures. As we talked about earlier, genomics is a huge um, industry with an estimated CAGR of around 50%. Furthermore, they've um, helped partner with some leading companies in AI imaging, which helps lead to earlier diagnosis and treatments. Um, they also have some substantial funding in R&D and have achieved economies of scale, which is consistent with their Kaizen princ principles, leading to um, control of both upstream and downstream um, of their supply chain. Furthermore, they are really, Danaher is really focused on trying to reduce the time to de develop the drugs so that they can be the first ones to market, which corresponds to improved market share and overall re revenues as a whole. So let's look at some of their, you know, m and activity over the years, right? They really, really are good at, you know, acquiring companies and then increasing margins and, you know, increasing production and increasing profitability overall. They've done this consistently with companies like Sativa and Pal. They've also been able to spin off companies um, such as Veralto, um, you know, which which represented their, you know, environmental um their environmental division um, and they're able to you know raise a lot of money for those businesses because they have very very high profitability and margins as well so over the past few years you know in 2020 we saw an extreme growth in m a volume and activity um, and the reason for this was because of the opportunities that covid the, that the covid pandemic showed with you know the, where they acquired a lot of very undervalued healthcare companies and they really converted that you know into things like nuclear testing and things like that and, and to be really really profitable this actually Activity has gone down um, in 2022, likely because of the economy, but we're seeing this pick up back again as you know the global um, uh, economy recovers from COVID. Um, now I'm going to talk about the historical stock chart analysis. As we can see, some of their major growths come with FTC approvals of some mergers, 
as well as some FDA approvals of some of their products. Some of the downturns, uh, downturns tend to correspond with some bioprocessing issues in China, which has been um, a concern as of late, but it has affected the industry as a whole. So not specifically to Danaher. Moving on to the discounted cash flow analysis, the um, Danaher has a terminal multiple of 19.4. We got this from NYU Stern. And I'm going to briefly touch about the bear and bull cases that we projected. The bear case is really going back to the um, geopolitical issues, specifically in the Chinese bioprocessing sector, which has seen some turmoil as of late. On the other hand, the bull case is going to be spurred by profitable M&A activity coupled with some favorable macro conditions. As a whole, we have a base case of 29.5%, and you can see the fluctuations with either a bear or a bull case. So let's look at Danaher compared to some of its competitors. Um, like they offer very similar product range to their main two competitors, Thermo Fisher and Abbott Laboratories. Um, and they offer a very wide range of products, but mainly their strengths lay in the fact that they have extremely high margins so that, you know, uh, lenders like they have, they're very reputable amongst lenders um, and they're willing to lend them more money than those companies. Uh, they also have very diverse portfolio that mitigates risk if, you know, one of their sub companies doesn't do very well. They also have like, you know, they're in like their very decentralized business model that allows their sub companies to innovate and create new products, which is ultimately good for them in the long run. Um, for the weaknesses and threats, it's in general just macroeconomic conditions, especially conditions abroad where are a lot of you know where the markets lie. Also, um, if you compare, but however, if you compare them to their competitors like Thermo Fisher and Adler Laboratories, they have way more assets and high quality and liquid current assets compared to those companies. Um, and you know this is mainly because they have very high margins that they're able to reinvest into the businesses. So we can see um, with the ratio analysis, you know, they, they have a relatively good uh, quick ratio there and they have like one of the best price to book ratio. So you're buying, you know, a lot of very high quality assets with, uh, you know, the money that you pay for each share on a relatively, you know, even a PE ratio compared to the rest of the companies. But as you can see, you know, they really emphasize margins, right? Their margins are higher than any other competitor um, and they really reinvest these margins um, and their profits, which is why you have a relatively lower uh, ROE. Um, and, you know, their main competitors in terms of market cap are also, you know, Thermal Fisher and Abbott Laboratories. But as you can see, they're much more profitable and have much more, you know, high quality assets compared to debt compared to those companies. Moving on to the technological disruption potential, as you can see, their sustainable IP generation really position, positions themselves significantly above the industry average with a patent quality score of 75%. In the past few years, their AAA ratings for their patents have grown, and they've maintained at least a AA patent quality average ratio. They also dominate in relevant biotechnology fields, controlling about 84% of reaction vessel patents over the past 20 years. That's also 79% for nucleic acid and cell fusions and 44% for mass spectrometry, spectrometry. Compared to other companies, um, if you look at the far right graph, they not only dominate in high portfolio patent size, but they also have high numbers of patents that all average a double A rating. Moving on to some recent technological dis um, developments with IDBS, they really uh, launched the biopharma, cloud-based management, um, Cytiva, they managed um, to acquire a company that streamlines drug purification process and in silico um, helps position themselves with generative AI. All right, thank you. Uh, now, finally, we, we'd like to look at the risks and mitigants of the company as well as why the future outlook is quite promising. Um, we spoke about before the, the how the reliance on bioprocessing in, in the biotech segment has left Danaher vulnerable to macroeconomic trends. Uh, this has actually had a considerable impact on Danaher's uh, Chinese revenues, uh, leading to a 45% decline, um, with double-digit declines as well in life sciences and biotech. Um, China is also unfortunately expected to be a headwind in 2024. Um, this, is this is further worsened by currency exchange volatility. The strengthening of the U.S. dollar relative to other currencies in different markets uh, proved this in 2022. Uh, lastly, fluctuating commodity prices could also compromise Danaher's production and performance targets, especially given that it's upstream and downstream in the, in the biotech supply chain. That being said, we believe that these concerns aren't warranted and are ultimately outweighed in the future. 
Um, a, a rebound in bioprocessing is anticipated with a double-digit exit rate in 2025, and the Chinese cyclical downturn in bioprocessing is expected to be reversed thanks to anticipated funding in Feb, March 2024. So luckily, uh, the quarter uh, the quarter one uh, results from 2024 will reflect this. Um, ultimately, additional M and A is expected as part of the strategy, which is which we've spoken about before. Uh, and the recent AppCam ac acquisition is expected to add at least two to two point two percent to the top line. Um, spinning off the environmental solutions into Veralto, uh, ultimately makes it a much more focused leader. Uh, and as as you can see below, uh, recurring revenues have increased from forty five percent twenty fourteen to an absolutely mammoth eighty percent twenty twenty four. Um, ultimately, to conclude, we believe that uh, Danaher's optionality throughout the, throughout throughout the portfolio and penetration to profitable end markets, its strong management, um, makes it play into long term secular tailwinds driven by its longevity, genomics, and biotech trends. Um, this coupled with its differentiated pos positioning within the industry, propelled by non core divestitures in organic and inorganic revenue streams, makes the company extremely well positioned. Um, and we therefore believe that Danaher um is an apt investment to make. Uh, thank you for your time. We'd now be open to any and all questions. Thanks, guys. I'm happy to lead us off. Um, I guess just the uh, first question is, I think back to slide seven, you have uh, basically momentum trends. Uh, it looks like, I think about three or four periods, you have basically negative momentum. Like you had, uh, I actually don't know exactly, I know you had three, five, and then probably one year. Um, but basically the question comes down to why would you buy Danaher right now? Obviously you have rates coming off peaks, but you have an m &A firm that's very much dependent upon accessing debt markets to fund, uh, mergers and acquisitions. And then, uh, kind of that tail, uh, combined with the, the China, um, headwind curious, like why right now? Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a pretty valid question. Uh, even we saw the momentum has been kind of topsy-turvy given, uh, macro trends. And as you obviously spoke about bioprocessing has been hit. Uh, the reason we want to buy it now is owing to its very promising um M and A setup. Uh, we saw that it it literally just acquired AppCam. I think that that deal happened in like December, late December twenty twenty three, um, and that is expected to add, to add value to the top line. Um, additionally, we've seen that the stock has been consistent ultimately, even though it's gone through like momentum uh shifts, especially after COVID and bioprocessing, um, and. Overall, we just believe that the M&A growth and M&A potential of the company is quite large. Uh, I spoke about also how uh, the M&A capacity has increased uh, thanks to a reduced uh, debt to EBITDA ratio as well. Um, so ultimately, right now, we believe that there's no reason to be really be concerned. Um, and analysis also reveals that the macro trends will reverse. Um, we, we saw that uh, a double-digit exit rate is actually expected for bioprocessing in 2025. Um, and there's expected to be more funding into bioprocessing by China uh, this year as well. So we, we, we are kind of hopeful and believe that um, these concerns aren't exactly warranted for the future. Also, um, in specific regards to uh, China, um, they basically, you know, st like in 2022 and the beginning of 2023, started buying less bioprocessing equipment because they had to use a lot for the COVID pandemic. Um, so we think that we take that as basically an abnormality, right, due to the COVID pandemic. And we, we think that, you know, the market um, has already sort of priced that in. We're really looking into the, into the future growth potential for these companies. You know, this is a very long-term investment because they're very good at growing companies in the long term. And, you know, like markets are obviously priced and you know the the the, the uh, interest environment um, and all of that, but I I think that you know they're like we really want to focus on you know them running and being good at running businesses um and, and that's also ultimately what's going to benefit um in the long run for the stock, not so much you know the short term macroeconomic environment. Sure, fair enough. Uh, I think I mean I, I do think it's realistic that you could have basically the added cost of debt still be outweighed by their ability to kind of cut down costs that the firms are acquiring. Um. Uh, do you know um, what portion of kind of these acquisitions they're doing is typically funded by public debt? Is that a uh, figure you guys have just to have an estimation of kind of what the comparable cost would be now for an acquisition versus prior years? Just given that's kind of their business model, I was wondering if you uh, have a general idea of how that might look typically. Um, I don't think we have the statistic for that particular metric, uh, but I think um, a lot of they, they, they've kind of reduced their reliance on debt uh, for any MA activity. Uh, we saw that because I think the Debt to EBITDA ratio has gone from two point five x to just two x, uh, which has gone down. Uh, we've also seen that the uh, the cost of debt has is like compared to the compared to like other competitors in the industry is quite low. I think we had like one point two percent, um, whereas companies like Thermo Fisher, 
um and agilent had uh, around like 3.7 3.8% so um we see that they're kind of redu- reducing their reliance on debt um and instead pouring like uh, their own revenues back into the company and using that for M&A growth. Um, I think we, I saw that uh, 80% of revenues are recurring back into the company. So their reliance on debt is just going down, but I don't have a, a stat for that particular metric. We can Ours. also see that they are a reputable lender among, let's see. They've been considered a reputable lender amongst um, some strong lenders. So that's another benefit that they have compared to some other companies. Great, thank you. All right. Choose. Do you want to? Do you have anything to jump in with? All right. So I guess first, like a dumb question. Um, when you're talking about the bioprocessing, so that's because they're selling like reactors into China. Like, like is that a supply issue or a a revenue issue? Um, it, it it's oh sorry. It's basically um, you know, China was in a period of you know COVID. So bioprocessing means you know any anything regarding you know like testing you know like companies that they own such as Abcam, Aldebaran. Um, that that offer like let's say nuclear tests and all of those like sort of processes. Um, they were selling a lot to China. Um, partly because of the COVID pandemic, China was really pouring money into hospitals. Um, uh, because of the amount of people, you know, like like while the West came out of COVID, let's say in twenty twenty one, China only opened up in the beginning of twenty twenty three. Um. And they really had to buy a lot of that, uh, and and also you know the economy, they, they, the government also injected a lot of stimulus just in general for all you know like health and and research, um, and they spent the money on equipment from Danaher, um, but as the the economy is doing like really bad now in China, and you know like there's there's just mass unemployment, you know companies are not really willing to invest anymore um, in new equipment, um, and they're using their old one, which is why we're seeing this decline. Um, in in revenue, um, we but we think that in the long term, as China comes out of this, you know, macroeconomic sort of slump, um, they're going, you know, these revenues are going to come back and grow even stronger because of you know how Danaher has great market penetration in foreign markets, um, better than companies like Abbott Laboratories and Illumina, um, and you know they're able to ultimately profit on this in the long term. I think. So like, what's their yeah, like, um, US also I, yeah, that's pretty valid. I also think that like. Um, it's important to realize that when you look at Danaher in China, um, it's a pretty like recent, um, pretty, pretty recent geographical diversification, right? Um, I think the revenue is currently there only make up like twelve percent, thirteen percent, which has become like quite substantial. But um, it wasn't like that. It wasn't like that before. So it's also important to realize that Danaher is still entering China, still diversifying in there. Uh, recently, I think they like established facilities, um, in different provinces and. Uh, it's actually become a pretty big employer in China. So uh, even though this is, I guess, a headwind for now, um, I honestly see it as a tailwind of the future because uh, we see that bioprocessing is going to like reverse and funding is going to go up. Um, and ultimately, I feel like the Chinese concern is honestly overblown. Um, in 2024, I feel like um, arguing that China is going to be a big issue is kind of justified, but um, in the years forward, I don't see it being a major issue. Okay. Well, I said we don't have too much time. I'll throw out like two last questions. Um, like one thing you noted is like that they have like a higher operating margin than the competitors, but they have a lower return on equity. Can you talk through that? Are they more capital intensive than their competitors or what's driving that? And then is there anything that's like a really huge story that could be there, like their iPhone, like in the sort of, you know, AI genomics, yada, yada, yada. What's like the product that's really going to like blow up and, and take this, this company to the next level? Um, yeah, so I think I'll address the first part of your question. Um, so we see that operating, so basically, um, their operating margins are kind of a direct product of their acquisitions. We see that they target companies primarily with higher operating margins, um, and lower SGNA costs. Now, why that doesn't translate back into ROT, ROE necessarily is because A. Danaher is definitely one of the biggest companies out there, right? It's, it's, uh, if you look at the competitors, they all have way smaller market caps. Their, their industries aren't that geographically diversified. Um, and therefore, their return on equity isn't that high. Another reason for that is um, they keep investing back into the company. They invest like 80% of their revenues back in. Um, and because of that, um, their return on equity, is, it, it doesn't really re- reflect. Um, you want to take the second part, Ryan? Yeah. Uh- Sorry. Um. With the in regards to the second question, they they do you know have like a lot of very very innovative products that are sort of like if you would say like like the iPhone. Uh. For example, you know under the company Citiva, for example, they they produce you know very very advanced like um systems for you know protein 
uh, you know, purification I read about called um, ACTA, and that's that's going to be used for you know all sorts of you know genomics testing and and and, and the you know like j just uh, diagnostics um in the future um and you know even in the past years they were one of the first players in the nuclear the new nucleic testing um industry you know when, when you went to get your nucleic acid test when you, know, you got tested for COVID it was uh, it was probably them who you know who provided the testing equipment um for all of that and they they have a lot of investment you know in future sort of um future diagnostics and you know with a focus on genomics as well um with abcam you know being focused on you know cell tissue imaging tools um cellular and you know bio biochemical assays um and they really and and they have you know great diagnostics and tools for uh proteins and 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 and, and you know uh, processing proteins um, and I, we think that this is what really gives them the advantage in this genomics field because they're really able to diagnose things uh, faster than anyone else and cheaper than anyone else. Um, and you know, I think that this is going to this is how they're going to target that future market um, in in genomics, um, which is very innovative. Right. I'd like to um, just point out that uh, uh, one of the sorry. main we, things we, that we, we think is really valuable for this company is that in 2020, 2020 they really seized on the market, as we can see, um, their M&A like skyrocketed, right? So they really took advantage of some other firms that were struggling during 2020 and were able to acquire them. And I think that's something that we're really going to be seeing long-term investments because M&A, it's kind of a long-term um, recurring like revenues that we're going to be seeing. So it might not be as instantaneous as like within a year, but I think the um, amount of mergers and acquisitions that they um, conducted during COVID is really going to be a strong player in the long-term future. All right. Thanks, guys. Uh, we have to move on to the next group, but uh, great job. Perfect. All right. Before we start, I'd like to thank Dartmouth Investment Philanthropy Program for putting this competition together. And, Mr. and thank you, Mr. Schaefer, Mr. Verdez, for taking the time to be here today. Uh, we're going to be pitching Backsite, ticker PCVX, with a price target of $0.76.95. By Q2 2026, a 26.8% upside. And going over what we're going to be going over today, we're going to start off with an industry overview, move into a company overview, then wrap it up into our investment thesis, and then we're going to move into our valuations. I'm Aaron Harrington. I'll let my members introduce themselves. I'm Nandini Agarwal. I'm Marella Stapia. And I'm Hondo Granio. And with that, I'll pass it off to Aurelis for the industry overview. Thank you, Aaron. The pneumococcal vaccine market is a winner-takes-all market, historically controlled by the best vaccine. With Pfizer's PCV13 and PCV20, consumers are willing to pay a premium for the additional stereotype coverage. This market is poised to grow from $7 billion to an estimated $13 billion due to strong growth in the adult market. Its spectrum of coverage drives adoption with U.S. CDC Advisory Committee on Immunizations Practices recommendations driving uptake. These vaccines are premium price, which will deliver high attractive profit margins. There's also a double revenue stream with Pfizer's Prevnar family generating over hundred billion in revenue. The adult segment makes up one third of the total market and consists of adults over 65 years of age who receive one dose costing an average of $175. The infant segment makes up the other two thirds of the total market. This segment consists of children younger than five years who will receive four doses at two, four, six, and 12 months with each dose averaging $500. In the U.S. alone, there are an estimated 900,000 pneumococcal pneumonia cases per year, resulting in 150,000 hospitalizations. Pneumococcal diseases are also one of the leading causes of death globally in children under the age of five years. Even with current vaccinations, an infected patient over the age of 65 has a 15% chance of fatality. In addition, current vaccines are becoming increasingly ineffective. Non-vaccine variants are increasing in prevalence, resulting in a need for broader spectrum vaccines like Vax24 and Vax31. As of 2020, there have been 100 documented serotypes, most of which cause serious diseases like pneumococcal pneumonia with an incubation period, bacteremia with a 12% fatality rate, and meningitis with a 14% fatality rate. Vaccite's competitors include Pfizer, Merck, and GSK. Pfizer's 2023 PCB revenue was approximately $6.3 billion. Its top offering is Prevnar 20, only covering 20 serotypes and offering 47.5% coverage within infants and adults. Merck's revenue was $602 million. Their top offering, V116, covers 21 variants and provides 60.2% of coverage, only within the adult segment. 
Lastly, GSK's PC revenue was 305 million. Its top offering, AFX 3772, covers 24 serotypes with 69% of coverage within the adult segment. Based on the graph, Vaxites outperformed its competitors with Vax24 and Vax31, providing more coverage within the infant and adult segment. Clinical trials start with a preclinical phase aimed at evaluating the drug's safety and potential side effects before starting human trials. Its duration may last between two to five years, as a 10% risk mitigation and a phase cost of 500K. Phase one focuses on initial safety dosage assessments and health volunteers. This phase may last between six to 12 months as a mitigated risk of 20% and cost of 1.1 million. Phase two evaluates the drug's effectiveness in a small group of patients with the disease and may last between one to two years. It has a 30% mitigated risk and a phase cost of $4.6 million. Phase three confirms the drug's effectiveness and safety at a larger scale and lasts between two to four years. It has a mitigated risk of 67% and a cost of 13.5 million. The last stage is FDA approval, which is a submission of a new drug application that is reviewed for safety and efficiency by the FDA. This may last between six to 12 months, has a mitigated risk of 81% and cost of $1.5 million. And now passing it on to Nandini with company overview. In a rapidly evolving healthcare landscape, Vaxite stands out as a key player with a compelling investment story. Let's take a closer look at this industry leader and why it's worth your attention. Starting with management, Mr. James Vassell has served as Chief Operating Officer of Vaxite since 2019 and its Executive Vice President since March 2022. He has extensive experience in developing and commercializing vaccines, having spent the past three decades of increasing responsibility in the vaccine divisions of Merck, Novaritis, and Pfizer. Vaxite's ownership and control over these vaccine candidates' intellectual property, development, and commercialization are wholly owned, paying a low fee of just 4% on their net sales, less than their competitors. Robust manufacturing capacity is a key pillar of Vaxite's strength. Through a strategic deal in, with Lonza, they've secured manufacturing capabilities in the tens of millions. What sets them apart is the flexibility preserved in this agreement. Limited restrictions empower them to adapt swiftly to market dynamics while meeting the growing demand for their vaccines. This shows us that this company is not only equipped with development and an in-works portfolio, but with its army of experienced management, commercialization is also under its belt. When Vaxite last reported its balance sheet in September 2023, it had zero debt and cash worth $1.3 billion. They have a cash bone of $500 million projected to commercialize their portfolio, and they aim to fund this through their current cash and additional share issuances that we have modeled into our valuation methods. Below, you can see a timeline for Vax24 and 31 with data for its PB. As we can see, Vax24 is, is successfully in phase three, making it a key player for the company's next few years. We have Vax31 coming out almost right after, also having been successful in its journey till now. Both vaccines act as potential catalysts catalyst for Vaxite. Uh, in the next slide, we look at Vaxite's PCV family design, showing us some various competitive advantages the company carries. Vaxite is poised to outperform its competitors through the utilization of superior technology, giving it a significant edge and making it a viable target for acquisition. Going down, we notice how Vaxite has a way more accelerated timeline than its other competitors, with Vax24 coming in the next few years and Vax31 soon after. This time frame is important because Vax31 plays a huge role in revenue stream and will prove to be category killing. I'd now like to hand it off to Aaron to talk about the catalyst. Thank you. Yeah, so now moving into our annotated catalyst timeline, I'd like to point out in 2022, we saw a pretty sizable gain due to the positive top line data for their phase one and two study for Vax24. And then we modeled into the future the risk adjustments that will come further for the risk de-risking events with VAX 31 phase one and two top line data for their adult study having an estimated 21.3% upside. And then in 2025 and 2026, we see VAX 24 phase one and two top line data for their infant study having around an 8% upside. And then VAX 24 moves from phase three to the FDA approval and having around a 9% upside. Lastly, in 2028, we have Vax24 65 plus entering the market, Vax24 infant and Vax31 50 plus moving to FDA review, Vax31 infant moving enters the phase one and two. And we're gonna assume a 21.5% upside based on our RMPV model. And summing all of this up, we have a risk adjusted 11.58 five year CAGR with this and a risk adjusted 21.3 one year upside. And with that, I'll pass it off to Hondo for the rest of our investment thesis. Thank you, Aaron. Jumping into the first thesis point, Vaxite is a strong target for Pfizer to acquire. Historically, Pfizer has dominated PCV development with their transition from PCV7 to PCV20. However, 10% of Pfizer's revenue is under pressure from the decline in COVID-19 related sales 
and loss of, and loss of exclusivity with patent expirations of top selling products. The chart in the middle is the Vaxite PTA, which will be touched upon in the valuation. Currently, Pfizer has no PCV developments in their pipeline that'd be competitive with next generation vaccines. Additionally, there are no other companies to be acquired following the $3.3 billion acquisition of Affinivax by GSK. This leaves Vaxite as the only independent company with a 24 valent PCV in development, and thus the only option for Pfizer to secure future revenue from PCV. For the roadmap for, the roadmap for Vaxite's acquisition, historical data has shown that transactions of this size materialize post phase three trials due to significant risk mitigation. PCV, assuming Pfizer could not develop a competitive next generation PCV, they must acquire Vaxite to maintain their competitive edge. Pfizer would be interested in Vaxite as it is facing intense competition in the PCV market for Merck and GSK, who are developing vaccines that would be superior to Pfizer's current leading offering. With Pfizer's lack of development in PCV, acquiring Vaxite would give them Vax31, which is expected to be a category killer in PCV. Additionally, the COO of Vaxite played a pivotal role in the success of Pfizer's vaccine department. This relationship is invaluable in aligning Pfizer's strategy with the Vaxite's operations. If Vaxite isn't acquired by Pfizer, they have the opportunity to take over the PCV market. Projected to grow to $12.5 billion by 2027, the PCV market is a winner-takes-all and dominated by the vaccine with the most coverage. With Vaxite's offerings, it can capture 75% of the market as current PCV offerings cover about 50% of serotypes, leaving Vax24 and Vax31 to, to take over with their 70% and 92% coverage, respectively. Vaxite's edge lies in its innovative, novel development process, which allows for more efficient production of complex proteins like those in PCVs, leading to decreased production costs. Vax24 will offer a broader range of coverage with an unprecedented 21% increase in serotype coverage. <clears throat> Additionally, Vaxite's leadership team is a powerhouse of industry veterans with a wealth of experience in vaccine development and commercialization. To achieve, to achieve market dominance, Vaxite needs to advance phase three trials to Vax, of Vax24 to secure regulatory approvals and solidify market dominance. Thus, then successfully commercialize Vax24 by leveraging its position as the first 24 valent vaccine in the market. Additionally, if Vaxite were to receive a recommendation from ACIP, this would be significant as these recommendations stand as public health guidance and would result in the mass adoption of Vaxite's offerings through a routine immunization schedule. Finally, the rapid adoption of Vaxite's portfolio across both the infant and adult markets is set to generate substantial revenue, which will allow for further Vax developments in the Vaxite pipeline to drive additional revenue through non-PCV developments. Outlining our first thesis point, Vaxite is a strong target to be acquired by Pfizer, as Pfizer is at risk of losing its share of the PCV market, around $6 billion and 10% of its revenue. With Vaxite's pipeline of category killing developments, Pfizer can secure its position in the market and set itself up for a dominating future. Our second thesis point is that if Vaxite were to not get acquired by a Pfizer, they have the opportunity to take over the $8 billion winner takes all market with their Vax24 development. Vaxite is set to revolutionize the PCV vaccine market, which is currently underestimated by many. With its innovative Vax24 and Vax31 vaccines, Vaxite is, just not, is not just challenging the status quo, but going for the top spot. <laughs> Vax24 shows potential to outperform Pfizer's PCV20, while Vax31 targets an impressive 90% of circulating serotypes, positioning Vaxite as a potential market leader. This disruption could be a game changer for Pfizer, whose Prevnar revenue is a key part of their business. For investors, this, this is, represents a golden opportunity in the $12.5 billion PCV market with Vaxite poised to capture a significant share. And with that, I'll pass it on to Aaron to touch upon our valuations. Yeah, so moving into our valuation, I'd like to start with our revenue projections and our key assumptions first, with the yellow boxes being where we're going to assume our peak revenue coming in based on a six-year ramp period based on the past Prevar family ramp up, with all development revenue being based on the historical growth rates for Syndrix, a development that ousted a once dominant player, Zosavex, through improved outcomes and an AIC preferred recommendation, with the orange boxes being our patent cliffs that we assume for each of the developments, with all of our revenue being risk-adjusted, by the phase of development that it is in. We put that into our DCF to where we got our implied valuation 
And due to the preclinical nature of PCVX, we observed a strong dependence on terminal EBITDA in our DCF implied equity value calculation. And due to PCVX having no debt obligations, we assumed an industry average whack of 11%. On top of our discounts to revenue, we feel that this model accurately assesses the risk that's in play and is overall very conservative. And moving forward, our COGS and OPEX are based on industry average observed from vaccine players across the industry. And even with our conservative model, we see at minimum a 3% downside or a maximum of 38% upside with our DCF. And as we addressed earlier, with we, we did four DCF models to assess the valuation impacts of dilution associated to build out Vaxite's portfolio. Moving into our PTA, we got to a 78.60 one day prior, 75.34 one week prior, 69.91 one month prior valuation based on the transactions that we felt best fit the potential transaction for Vaxite. <laughs> Moving to our risk adjusted net present value model, the key dates that I'd like to point out is 2030, Vax 31 adult gets approved and enters the market. In 2036, Vax 31 infant enters the market. In 2029, Vax, Vax 24 adult enters the market. And in 2031, Vax 24 infant enters the market. And I'd like to point out on the chart on the bottom, we see a peak in RMPV value happening in 2031 due to all of their developments being de-risked at this point and a sizable ramp up period until then. And wrapping us up, we got to an implied valuation of $76.95. And even with a sizable dilution with our DCF, we got to, we hit our implied share price and we also see the potential for more gain if the dilution event does not hit the worst case scenario. And I'd also like to add all of our RMPV models are based on the worst case scenario of 150 million shares outstanding coming to the market. And with that, we are open for questions. Thank you. Thanks, nicely done. Um, I'm wondering if we can just talk through kind of your risk adjusted uh, pricing graph back yeah. on, I think it would have been maybe 10 slides back, just to dig in there a little bit. And I guess I'll this start one? off my question. Um, yeah, this one's perfect. So you're basically saying you're risk adjusting for the given phase of trials you're in. Um, that risk adjustment, is it based on other PCV uh, like in the market or like how, how are you truly risk adjusting the phase based upon kind of where we are uh, with their development? Yeah, so we took an industry average for the assumed risk of going to market for each of the development phases. And then we assigned that risk that risk that is still to be assumed of the development. So for example, if it's in phase one, we're assuming that there's a lot of risk left. If it's in phase three, there's a lot less risk. Um, and with that, we assume the step-ups as we start to de-risk their portfolio over time that will assume more valuation from those uh, de-risking events. Got it, yeah. So the, basically the risk adjustment is done industry average, not necessarily just for like PCV in particular. Yes, That's, industry average okay. across the board, yes. Perfect, super helpful. Can and you then, go um, the go on this chart? Sorry, what? Well, I say, while we're on this chart, like yeah. um, basically they don't have enough cash to get to the end of this chart, if I understand that correctly. Sure. And so like, how does, can you walk through that? Like at what point are they gonna have to do a big raise and just walk through what you said about the um, worst case and best case assumptions? Yeah, I would love to. So on the cash runway, which is on the top right of that chart, that's what we projected their cash burn to be roughly 500 million a year. And we assumed we, they would need to raise around 375 million in share issuances through 2025 to 2029, which would get them to that 150 million worst case scenario. Um, assuming that they do not take on debt obligations, which we assume uh, with lowering rates on the near term, that that might be an option for them as well. And, and just walk through on that chart, yeah. like where that happens, you think, and like what sort of the, you know, best case, worst case scenario is. I'm just trying to picture like, yeah, you know, what's the risk if if things get delayed, you know, if um, yeah, if, yeah, if you could just kind of walk through that. Yeah, I think on this slide right here, the bottom development timeline would be the best to answer that one. Um, I think we are very conservative in nature with where we're seeing them enter their phases and the movement along that chain, um, with quite exactly um we have their phase th 31 well, not 31 phase one and two for the vax 31 data coming out towards year end 24 um the market's seeing that more towards you know mid-year um so we're very like i would say almost bearish on where they're going to you know release those events but we're still seeing the upside that's going to occur from that
The very, very cool. So, so basically, the story here is like there's vaccines out there that cover fifty percent of the, of the, you know, types of things. This is yes. something that everybody gets, like when they're kids, and there's and this will take it from fifty to seventy five percent of, uh, of coverage. That that's what you're saying. Yeah. So right now, uh, the PCV twenty, which is Favar twenty, it currently covers roughly fifty. With Vax24, we're going to see a step up to around 70% coverage, which is a very sizable step up that we haven't seen in years. And then it, I think it's like a year or two after when Vax31 comes onto the market, we're going to see that go to 90%, which is a crazy number of coverage for a vaccine development that will basically kill all the competition in that category. So competition, is there anything else out there that's going through the same process that could yeah. be the winner take all? Um. So the only developments that we're seeing right now is B116 by Merrick and then AFX3772, which is in phase two. Um, these developments cover roughly around 24 of the stereotypes, which is going to be in that 70% range, um, which even if those come out, I think we can assume, and we, I did model this into our valuation, that there's going to be a split of 50% with Vaxite and GSK. And then with Vax31 comes onto the market, there's going to be a more sizable 75% um, market share dominance by that development that we see with Pivar20 currently on the market. Alice, do you want to jump in? This graph might help show like the how sizable the winner-take-all market is with that. No, uh, yeah, just one more question for me because yeah. I know we're probably have two minutes left or so. I know um you basically did like I said we got through the risk adjusted graph already. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't look like you've calculated any component of that for a potential acquisition, and so I've just uh, just just to estimate it. Um, what does a typical acquisition premium look like? Um, and I, I, I assuming that basically none of those three major companies that are producing a vaccine or sorry developing a vaccine currently would uh, look to acquire PVCX until uh they basically see. So issues with efficacy or, or development of their own product? Yeah, so um, we used our PTA to kind of get like the present transaction of where we may see that transaction be at. I think we're seeing around that 75 range. Um, and then to answer your other question, I think when we look at the other competitors in the market on this graph, the only one without a development to even, you know, compete with Vaxite's worst offering, the 24 offering, which is still a, amazing offering on the market is Pfizer. They do not have anything in development that will come to the market in the next 20 years to where their $6 billion, which is 10% of their total revenue, is at serious risk. And Merrick and GSK have their own developments that they, you know, they feel confident in to be competitive. Um, but of course, we see Pfizer having, you know, a lot more issue with, on that regard. Got it. So sorry, I, I did miss the um the estimation of the uh, of acquisition price. So it basically sorry. is on top of what you're. No, no, no. Um, no. I, I mean, I missed it when you guys went through it the first time. Um. So basically, you have your acquisition price almost on top of what you, your estimate would be for what twenty twenty or twenty thirty one, assuming everything goes as expected. Is that kind of how you view this currently? So, so seventy six versus seventy five. So right now, this is based on the current share price that we got. Um. So this yeah. one day prior was for January 13 when we um, submitted the pitch. Yep. Um, so we assume, we based it off of their one day prior premium since they have no yep. um, true valuation multiples to go off of, mm -hmm. um, which we assume the 78 number and you know roughly a range in between there is what we see happening. Okay, yeah. great. Thanks guys, appreciate yeah, of course. it. course, thank you. Yep, uh, I think we'll, we'll be moving on, but that was great guys, thank, thank you guys for coming. Okay. We want to start today by thanking your judges, Mr. Schaefer and Mr. Vertes, for taking the time out of your weekend to judge this competition and enable our learning. Thank you as well, The Dip, for hosting this competition. Hello, my name is Jay Griffith. I'm working with Amaya Deo, Arnav Verma, and Tatejas Kikore to present Snowflake. We've worked very hard on researching this investment and are excited to present the opportunity to buy Snowflake today at an undervalued position with a meaningful opportunity for upside growth. Our valuation projects a 22.1% upside. Snowflake disrupts on-premise data providers by moving cloud data warehousing solutions to the cloud. 
At Snowflake's inception, it was the first to move data warehousing to the cloud, giving the company a large first mover advantage. Snowflake also has multiple unique selling points that position the company to be the industry leader in cloud data warehousing solutions. First, Snowflake is 50 times faster at data processing and analytics than legacy providers. Snowflake can also operate with multiple users accessing the data at the same time, not losing any functionality with scale, whereas their legacy on-premise competitors fail at scale. Snowflake also is a unique data sharing system and data marketplace that allows their customers to easily access data across accounts, a platform that is growing 9% quarter over quarter. Finally, Snowflake operates on a consumption-based pricing model, which means that consumers only pay for what they consume, illustrated on the graph on the right. This is a major advantage because it allows Snow to market their services to all company sizes, from startups to Fortune 500 businesses. The investment thesis slide. Today, the investment opportunity we prevent for Snowflake is built on one major basis. We see massive potential for market growth that is currently not priced into the stock. We believe Snowflake is fundamentally undervalued in that the company is positioned very well to, to capitalize on important market trends. First, Snowflake is pivotal for the boom in AI. Snowflake, the largest cloud data warehouse, provides companies with the data required to train their AI in large language models. AI strategy needs a data strategy, and Snowflake is at the center of this tailwind. Another major tailwind for Snowflake is the continued adoption of the cloud. As you will later see, Snowflake's revenue is a derivative of cloud growth. The cloud market has increased by over $100 billion in the past 10 years, positioning the company to capitalize on growing cloud data needs. Snowflake also has a massive opportunity to expand its total addressable market by unlocking $130 billion of TAM through the OLTP market. Snowflake currently primarily competes in the online analytical processing market, but the company is beginning to make forays into the transaction processing market. In the transaction processing market, specific use case, high performance, immediate data analytics are used to guide decisions. This is exactly where Snowflake provides value with their 50 times faster data processing than legacy processors. Finally, Snowflake has a remarkable leadership team that is led by CEO Frank Slootman, who has a proven track record. He took ServiceNow from $100 million in revenue through IPO to $1.4 billion in revenue. As generative artificial intelligence is taking the world by storm, it is pertinent, that, is pertinent to remember that creating a good AI strategy requires an excellent data strategy. That's where Snowflake comes in. Snowflake has recently partnered with NVIDIA and Weights and Biases to allow consumers to craft and calibrate both artificial intelligence and LLMs on their platform. The LLM market is projected to grow to $41 billion by 2029 with a CAGR of 21.4%. Snowflake has positioned itself to be at the forefront of AI's future. In particular, Snow's recent acquisition of Neva signals fortune for their AI expansion. Neva pioneered Retrieval Augmented Generation Framework, which essentially is an AI search framework that allows LLMs to access data, allowing AI models to use fresh and factual information and its users to transparently see where the information was retrieved from. This partnership merges Neva's cutting edge search functionality with Snowflake's very ex, ex sorry snowflake's excellent data platform to make search more intelligent at scale for ais and llms developed on their platform additionally we are seeing very large tailwinds in cloud adoption the cloud is growing at 20 percent year over year and as more companies move to the cloud and move their data to the cloud snowflake is in an optimal position for growth if you look here at the graph on the left as cloud revenues increase quarter over quarter, Snowflake's product revenue is increasing as well. However, Snowflake revenue is not simply growing at a proportional rate. Snowflake is actually growing at a higher than proportional rate and taking up an increasing market share of the cloud. 
Snowflake's revenue is a derivative of cloud growth. And as the cloud is going to continue to grow, Snowflake is in an optimal position to take share. Snowflake is going to expand the total addressable market for cloud solutions through organic growth. The TAM is estimated to double over the next five years with a CAGR of 16.7%. According to Gartner, customer spending on data services is increasing across the board, but is highest for platforms with AI applications at 22.6 CAGR. Snowflake's net retention rate of 135% is a testament to how seamlessly they can integrate new customers and retain their business. The steady increase in levered cash flow is providing Snowflake with more cash to reinvest into their products. In fact, 75% of their liabilities are unearned revenue. And the current to total asset ratio signals high liquidity of assets, allowing them to easily expand into new markets as they arise. Snowflake is well positioned to capitalize on these expansions, increasing margins and lowering costs along the way. Overall, Snowflake's platform actively encourages companies to transition more and more of their data to the cloud. And as they do, Snowflake's financials enable it to continuously improve the customer experience and tap into emerging markets. Snowflake has remained resilient despite tough market conditions. Over the last few years, they have weathered large sell-offs from insider lockup releases and temporary slower growth in product revenue. Higher interest rates translated into companies across industries reducing costs, particularly in cloud expenditures. More recently, earnings per share grew 127%, which reinforces their commitment to creating shareholder value. With a projected annual top line growth of 30%, the business is primed for higher profits as revenue increases. Their acquisitions, especially those of data cleanroom companies like Samuha, demonstrate their commitment to enabling forums to collaborate on shared data. Most notably, the NVIDIA partnership was announced during the Snowflake Summit in June 2023. Companies will be able to feed data from Snowflake Data Cloud into NVIDIA Nemo, enabling them to train LLMs on their own proprietary information. This will ultimately protect customers against hallucinations, a widespread issue seen in other early adopters too quick to implement AI solutions. The cloud computing market is projected to be 0.68 trillion in 2024 and 1.44 trillion in 2029. Looking at the industry as a whole, major cloud providers typically fall into one of three categories. Next-gen solutions driven by AI technologies seek to give businesses substantial control over their data. Within this category, Snowflake's emphasis on ease of use makes their products significantly more attractive. Big tech firms have integrated platforms, but they suffer from non-flexible pricing models and limited scalability. And of course, data, legacy data providers are severely limited in concurrency and data transfers. Snowflake's data marketplace makes it easy for businesses to seamlessly share their data. Many companies have massive amounts of unused data and Snowflake is appealing to them with its elastic scalability, automated resource allocation and data compatibility. So we've heard a little bit about what Snowflake does and what their competitors do, but what sets them apart? Well. First, their sticky data sharing. Snowflake pioneered an innovative system titled Secure Data Sharing that enables data producers to safely and securely share data with consumers. The main selling point is that no actual data is copied or transferred, so it's entirely secure. All sharing uses Snowflake service layers and metadata stores, making it instantaneously accessible and secure among Snowflake customers. Major competitors lack a comparable sharing feature. This is especially important uh, because data sharing is becoming more prevalent as seen in Snowflake's internal data sharing trends. Trends will, will only be exacerbated by the high demand of data used by LLM trainings. And since Snowflake has both a superior data sharing platform and a first mover advantage in the space, a flywheel effect is created where clients wishing to access data managed by Snowflake will also be persuaded into doing business with Snowflake. This is important, considering their unique customer base. Snowflake is the data management warehouse for 31% of the Forbes 2000 companies. As the network effect of sticky data further takes hold, Snowflake will accumulate more clients at a rapid pace. Furthermore, as Jake explained earlier, Snowflake is becoming more of a nicety and more of a necessity. And Snowflake boasts a 135% net revenue retention rate, an exceptional figure that is uncommon in the industry. To illustrate this, while five out of seven of the biggest data warehousing companies reported losing customers last month, Snowflake netted 33. Snowflake's pay-as-you-go model further sets them apart from the competition. 
while competitors like SAP Business Warehouse are still tethered to a monthly subscription model that relies on consumers overestimating their data needs, Snowflake's pay-for-what-you-go model removes the financial uncertainties that often accompany data scaling, making it easy and accessible for low consumers, for low-cost consumers. But beyond the payment model, Snowflake is continuously looking for ways to save their customers money. Repeated improvements to software, including processing speed, AI, AI integration, and performance metrics, save their customers a lot of money. And while legacy investors may view this as a negative, arguing a potential revenue decrease, we posit that this is one of Snowflake's biggest strengths. By cutting costs, Snowflake encourages customers to commit larger workloads and purchase more credit. For example, in 2023, Snowflake signed ESO, an industry leader in software companies serving EMS and hospital services. And with Snowflake, ESO reduced their data infrastructure costs by 64%. And in return, ESO increased data stored by over 200%. Furthermore, their products actually become so efficient that customers spend more with Snowflake than they initially project, as shown on the graph to the right, where their actual product revenue consistently in, uh, exceeds the pre-optimization forecasts. Furthermore, uh, when we look at the comparative valuation and how we should value Snowflake, we first must understand that Snowflake is a rapidly growing company. For example, a 98% uh, Snowflake has a 98% uh, three-year uh, CAGR, and as a result, using a PE ratio or an EV to EBITDA ratio doesn't necessarily make sense, as Snowflake isn't earning yet. Furthermore, a EV to revenue uh, multiple of 20x might scare off in legacy investors, but it is important to recognize that Snowflake's focus, as of now, is on growth and expansion into industries like AI instead of margin optimization or cost-cutting at this point. Instead, we opted to look at the EV to revenue to revenue growth rate in order to factor in the fast growing nature of the company. And when we do so, we see that the EV to revenue to growth rate is at a 0.6 multiple, a 75% discount to other large cap software peers. Sto uh, Snowflake's stellar growth rate and industry defining technology poises it as a perfect investment. You have two minutes left guys. Snowflake stands out as a paradigm of hypergrowth with a remarkable three-year revenue CAGR of 98%. A strategic allocation of around 40% of its revenue towards R&D underlines Snowflake's commitment to innovation, especially in growing fields. And we believe that this is a calculated move to penetrate new markets and solidify its foothold. Concurrently, we're witnessing a significant reduction in SG&A and operational expenses, a testament to Snowflake's evolving efficiency. The company's impressive net retention rate of 135% underscores its market traction and customer satisfaction. And as Snowflake continues to expand and optimize, we anticipate a trajectory towards heightened profitability, propelled by a robust year-over-year -year revenue growth and cost efficiencies. Turning over to our DCF analysis, we've adopted conservative estimates to ground our valuation. Yet, given Snowflake's high growth nature and its strategic marketing positioning, there's a very real capacity for outperformance. A notable aspect of our DCF is the trend in networking capital, which becomes negative over time. This is largely due to an increase in unearned revenue, as seen in the chart in the middle, reflecting the company's growing base of long-term contracts. As unearned revenue continues to push current liabilities higher and generate healthy free cash flow, and current assets grow at a steady rate, the networking capital will eventually turn negative. Finally, we conclude with the risk analysis. First and foremost, many investors may argue Snowflake's valuation appears steep. However, when we pivot from traditional PE metrics to EV revenue growth multiples, Snowflake presents a compelling value proposition, trading at a discount relative to its peers. Second, macroeconomic trends pose another challenge. Slowed spending and budget constrictions may lead companies to take advantage of Snowflake's consumption-based pricing model. However, despite these trends, Snowflake has faced no sizable backlash. Their net retention rate remains at a stellar 135%, and customers are becoming more and more reliant on Snowflake, Snowflake products than ever before. Finally, as the market for data increases, Snowflake's competitors do as well. And as such, Snowflake faces competition. Snowflake, however, is taking several steps to ensure that they win. Financially, they continue to spend large portions of their revenue on R&D and reinvest that revenue back into the company. 
Their net retention rate demonstrates that Snowflake continues to secure a large and distinguished client base. And furthermore, Snowflake's superior products and innovation give them a first movers advantage. As long as they continue to produce high quality products, Snowflake is on track to stay far ahead of its competitors. All in all, Snowflake is very well poised to take advantage of AI and cloud industry trends, enter new untapped market and create strong financials to back its growth. As such, we strongly believe that Snowflake presents itself as the perfect investment opportunity. Thank you. Any questions? I guess I could start. Like, like suppose I'm a new company building like an AI business. Like, why would I choose Snowflake versus the competitors? And can you talk through what you think the stickiness and pricing power uh, story looks like? Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to take that. Um, so there's a couple things, right? One, if I'm a small company, costs really matter. Um, and so Snowflake cuts costs a lot. Um, and the processing speed is also 50 times higher than legacy. Oh, okay, I mean, cuts cost versus what? Like, suppose I'm a new company and I'm just starting like a big data initiative, you know what I'm saying? And I, actually, that I, that was one question I had about the slide because you mentioned ESO cut costs a bunch, but do you yeah. know like versus what? Like, what were they migrating from? So um, the uh, report didn't actually say what they were uh, ESO yeah. was migrating from, but we we're assuming that it is one of the competitors. Okay. Um, the important part to recognize, though, is that um, when you're storing your data, um, you can either do it with a data warehouse or you can do it yourself. Most people choose a data warehouse. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I might know too much about this one, but it's, you know, I feel like for most companies, it's like Databricks versus Snowflake. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they kind of like leapfrog everybody else in kind of the modern data stack. And it's kind of like, if you like SQL, you do Snowflake. If you like Python, you do Databricks. And then a lot of these other guys are, are kind of legacy. And But but I guess the, wor the worry I have is about kind of pricing power, like for, for something like Snowflake. But yeah, that's that's pretty much all I got. The growth story is definitely there. Like, I don't know like where they sort of get the stickiness and the long-term pricing power. I Amanda, mean, do you want to go to the first slide quickly? Uh, here, if you look at the cost structure versus the legacy, as you were saying, the legacy providers, legacy providers, these massive buildings, very clunky equipment, and just 50 times slower compared to Snowflake. If you look at the blue on this graph here, that is the usage of a company. And um, that black line is how much Snowflake will typically charge for the usage. Uh, at the same time, you can see the yellow line, which is the traditional legacy provider and that difference is the cost saving that these companies are typically getting yep yeah i definitely i totally get that that you know if you're using like teradata or something that's legacy and expensive you know it's you know it's, it's, you're gonna get huge increase in cost performance like one of the things yeah you know, i would look at um there's this whole like instacart sort of controversy and then you know like there's this whole this this iceberg issue. Like there is like an open standard where you can kind of store kind of OLAP data like fairly cheaply, and you know it's that that's the that's so that's where I sort of wonder like if they can really if it's really sticky and if they can really kind of uh, they have pricing power, and like the data mart story is also very interesting because there's so much places there's so much data exhaust coming from so many places and. Like if you're a hedge fund looking at alternative data, just keeping track of it and you know having a process for bringing it, you know, taking advantage of it, is is kind of challenging. So having like a one stop shop, you know, is 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 potentially interesting. But being able to protect that as a moat is also kind of hard because nobody wants to, you know, no, nobody no, like you know like like I'm not sure about the platform. Um, characteristics of it you know aws is kind of like the new microsoft it's like once you're in aws it's kind of hard to migrate to gcp or azure and with snowflake i just wonder how hard it is to just take your data and keep it in and, and move to like you know like an open platform like one of the apache you know iceberg or alternative formats you know or migrate to databricks that's what i kind of wonder about is like what the stickiness and pricing power is going to look like yeah yeah just really, 
address that um, if I could. Um, so what I meant by the stickiness of the data is that um, Snowflake has a data sharing feature um, where if you send it to another person, you don't actually send the data. Um, it's yep. not copied, it's not transferred. So the Instacart worries, not a problem with Snowflake. Um, and then the pricing power, it's a pay as you go model. So um, for smaller companies who are just looking to store their data, you only pay for what you use. Alec, yep. do you want to jump in? Ask yeah, questions. I'll ask you a quick question. I know we're I'm short on time, but it's kind of centered around what you're just getting at too, is you end up calculating, I think, 31% year over year growth kind of with what you see this ultimately falling to. I know it's hard to estimate what's going to happen with a first mover, especially when there are really two main competitors in the industry. Um, would you walk with you kind of how you fell to that 31% um, number, how realistic you think it might be and kind of, uh, I guess, top side and bottom side for where you think year over year growth could end up? Sorry, are you referring to our uh, DCF uh, slide? I believe so. There's a chance 31% wasn't the year over year number. I thought it was, but actually it might be back a slide from here. Yeah, right here. So you have uh, your fourth bullet. If you could walk with you, just kind of how you got that got to that calculation and then ultimately the normalization number of 20% too. Yeah, sure. So what we basically thought was um, we would go ahead and compare Snowflake with these large cap tech stocks, as you can see, Amazon, Google, Meta, Microsoft, as well as some more, um, as well as other competitors that are more snowflake size, such as Oracle and ServiceNow and CrowdStrike. Um, we essentially decided to use industry averages to get to that number. Um, as you can see, uh, we see the SGNA margins get to about 20% year over year um, in these very mature, very large cap tech stocks. And you see similar trends with uh, Snowflake and its competitors um, just falling and reaching that 20% year over year. Uh, something else that we noticed was that as Snowflake continues to grow and tap into new markets, um, we understand that over time, they might have to spend more money on SGNA in order to push new products into the market. However, we project that with this year over year revenue growth, the SGNA spend as a percentage of revenue would actually stay at around 20% because they have such good revenue growth rates. Um, we got this 31% by reading reports um, as well as just looking through the 10K and looking at future projections. All right. Thanks guys. Yeah, I think there's a little bit Fantastic. of a... Okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mihu Joshi, and I'm joined today by Ben Pruthi and Madeline Feldner. We're here today to present Occidental Petroleum, a company that has shown immense potential in market penetration and the establishment of an economic moat that has allowed them to undergo impressive growth. Our price target is a little above $100, with a total implied upside of around 76%. The expected investment horizon is about five years, but in optimal circumstances, we could see this position paying off within three years due to accelerated catalyst growth. Oxy is a large cap equity with over $49 billion in market capitalization. The oil industry is notoriously volatile, with prices that are affected by a variety of factors, including geopolitical events, supply and demand dynamics, OPEC decisions, and more recently, the transition to renewable energy sources. These can lead to substantial fluctuations in company valuations and revenues. And there are a few key reasons as to why Occidental is currently mispriced, even taking into account this volatility. The market is mispricing Oxy because of false comparisons to key competitor, Pioneer Natural Resources, Oxy has shown innovation in sustainable designs in an industry which is starting to see repercussions for not becoming greener. Their novel direct air capture technology, also known as DAC technology, allows for profitability, regardless of the changes in government regulations. And holistic industry predictions, along with our unique analysis of the meteorological impacts of oil futures, imply segment growth. Now we'll dive into these in our three main pieces related to Oxy's carbon engineering, the demand for carbon removal credits, and the high correlation between oil futures and Oxy. Our key, Our key assumptions in this pitch are that Oxy's DAC segment will continue to operate. There won't be any large man management changes. The government will continue to incentivize greener technologies and global warming will continue to have large meteorological impacts. Thank you, Mihir. While most of uh, Oxy's revenue comes from their oil and gas segment, Oxy also has segments in chemical and what they call their midstream and marketing segment. 
The oil segment has holdings around the world. Their largest holding is in the U.S. in a region called the Permian Basin, where they are the second largest holder of reserves. The midstream and marketing segment is also especially notable because it is where Oxy houses their work with direct air capture or DAC. Um, generally, Oxy sells what are called CDRs to other firms. These CDRs are essentially carbon credits. They are an agreement to remove a certain amount of carbon from the air. This is where the DAC technology comes in. And companies purchase these CDRs in order to essentially put their name on carbon removal. So this flow chart here on the right kind of shows how companies pay Oxy to remove carbon. And then how those carbon credits count against the carbon emissions of that company. So that can qualify a company for tax reductions. So essentially, this is like a company paying to have a tree planted in their name. The company pays Oxy, Oxy removes the carbon, and then the company gets to tell the government that we're net zero because we financed, you know, even though we emitted X tons, we financed the removal of X tons. So thus, we emitted nothing. And because these emissions are, in essence, canceled out, the uh, companies then qualify for what are called these 45Q tax credits, and these lead to reductions in the taxes that the companies pay to the federal government. The advantage that Oxy has here is that when they're planting these trees, if you will, um, other startups don't really have like the tools, the shovels, the anything that is necessary to actually do this yet. And so Oxy holds this first mover advantage because A, the other DAC companies aren't ready to start selling their CDRs. And B, other companies that are more on the carbon emission side, those companies don't have the existing tech infrastructure to remove the carbon from the air themselves. Great, thank you, Ben. Now, in order to increase the depth of our analysis, we wanted to try and quantify as much information as possible to see whether external circumstances might have an impact on Oxy's price. So in order to do this, we attempted to translate meteorological indicators into projections for oil prices. Now, typically, sell-side firms take advantage of OPEC's data lake, and they leverage this information with weather indicators to gain insight into commodity trading. While conducting a literature review for this pitch, we came across this paper by Xu et al., who published their models for predicting crude oil prices using an extreme weather index. We followed a similar methodology to try and see if we could gain insights into how oil prices would change, which, as you'll hear from Ben later, translated it into how we could predict Oxy's price. The big key takeaway here is that we are trying to see how similar the changes in extreme weather and the changes in the prices of the West Texas intermediate oil futures were. Now, in practice, this kind of regression analysis can be used to understand how changes in one variable, like some economic indicator represented by EWAT, might affect another variable, like the returns of an investment over time. The alpha and beta values were estimated using ordinary least squares to best fit the available data, and the standard error term captures the randomness and noise in the data that is not explained by the model. Now, in accordance with how Xu et al. simplified their calculation, we conducted an exponential regression to track how their correlation changes as the time horizon increases. As you can see, it came up with a total R-squared value of around 94%, which creates about 100% correlation when rounding up between our R-squared values and the investment as well as the EWA. This allowed us to inform a 12% growth projection in our oil grass revenue, which we modeled into our DCF. Taking a quick overview of the oil and gas industry, oil and gas are the world's most influential segments within the global energy market involved with the production, storage, and distribution of oil. Major factors which affect oil prices are economic growth, international supply, and demand within the transportation sector. For example, OPEC controls 72% of the world's oil reserves and its target production values can greatly influence global supply, which affects price. That being said, looking internationally, OPEC has been decreasing its distribution worldwide and the US and China are increasing their oil reserves to adapt to OPEC's pivot. A new challenge facing the oil industry is how each company will navigate the transition to climate-focused business practices. These industry-wide goals of transitioning to clean energy and responding to geopolitical tensions will impact the oil industry heavily in 2024. First, let's look at clean energy. Examples of green domestic international policy include the United States Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, along with the EU's Net Zero Industry Act, which both regulate and incentivize a clean energy transition. For example, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act dumps $7 billion directly into direct air capture facility funding. Further, by 2027, the ICAO will require all airlines to offset annual emissions with a some sort of carbon credit. 
Geopolitical tensions within Russia and the Middle East will also influence oil prices in 2024. The evolving situation in these areas will increase energy price volatility, as well as implications for international trade, which increases the demand for U.S. oil. This can be exemplified with the case between Russia and the U.K., where the U.K. has turned to its own oil due to geopolitical tensions. Thirdly, the demand for the pure oil segment within big oil companies themselves is rising slowly by only 0.4% million barrels per day in 2024. So oil companies are beefing up their non-oil segments to catch more demand. Increasing investments in biofuels, chemicals, and carbon capture begin to assume more R&D investment. Thank you, Maddie. In terms of competition, Oxy may be priced as its key competitor in the Permian Basin, that would be Pioneer Natural Resources, or its competitors in the big energy and carbon capture space. The overarching difference that we're going to see here is that Oxy is very diversified. Oxy has holdings all over the world, unlike Pioneer, which is really concentrated in the Permian Basin. And unlike its big energy and carbon capture competitors, Oxy is involved in multiple industries. I'll talk a little bit more later about how some of these big energy companies like Exxon and Chevron are sort of shifting towards specifically renewables. Whereas Oxy is definitely maintaining its presence both within its renewables segment, but also holding on to what it has in oil and gas. Furthermore, according to Oxy CEO Vicky Holub, because the competitors are divesting from oil and gas, while Oxy reinvests its revenue from renewables back into oil and gas, this is going to position Oxy to capitalize on increasing oil prices more than its competitors in big oil. That would be Exxon, Chevron, BP, et cetera. It is also worth noting that Exxon has announced plans to acquire Pioneer. So that would be our box here on the left being acquired by Exxon. Um, it's just really important to note, however, that the merger is being investigated by the FTC currently. And there's a really large spread between the acquisition price and the current Pioneer share price, which means that the market is implying a lot of uncertainty about whether this deal actually goes through at the price mentioned. Thank you, Ben. For our first investment thesis, we have focused on the demand increase and operating expenditure decrease Oxy's direct air capture facilities create. Touch on the DAC technology itself, direct air capture facilities use solar energy powered fans to capture CO2 from the atmosphere. Liquid sorbents within the DAC draw in carbon to create pure CO2. This pure CO2 can be stored underground or used in other carbon products. These facilities plan to remove 500 million tons of CO2, 500,000 tons of CO2 per year. Oxy is the industry first, industry-wide first mover in the DAC space. Its largest facility, Stratos, plans to open in 2025. DAC 1 and DAC 2 plan to open in 2024. Huge investment in these technolog technologies are noted by the represented $550 million and $1.2 billion investments from BlackRock and the U.S. Department of Energy. These DACs create new lines of businesses and major profit opportunities. First, Oxy has a major profit opportunity with carbon removal credits. Oxy notes 90% of captured CO2 will be available for CDR sales. The other 10% will be used to enhance their already great oil segment. Oxy and Oxy Low Carbon Ventures have the opportunity to release low carbon products such as polyester, food, and detergent. Oxy's potential acquisition of Crown Rock will grant them premier share access within the Permian Basin, diversifying their products from different forms of oil. Thirdly, Sustainable Airline Fluid, or SAF, a non-petroleum alternative to jet fuel, greatly complements CDR credits in light of the ICAO's regulations. Looking at operating costs, the market finds some skepticism in the ability of these facilities to to profit with high operating costs. However, the market fails to note the synergies with, within Oxy's OxyChem segment in optimizing DAC productions. OxyChem's research development in liquid sorbents can optimize carbon sequestration, which is expected to cut OPEX by 50% over the next few years. Modeling our valuation projections, we see a company with accelerating growth due to Oxy's new business segments. When compared to Oxy historicals, when inserting our valuation into a polynomial regression model, the model returned a model with a quadratic relationship between revenue over time rather than linear. This suggests Oxy's new lines of business will accelerate their revenue growth and support our claims. Now, looking specifically at Oxy's carbon removal credits or CDRs, Oxy CDRs will pose a major revenue driver as government incentivization increases. CDRs address a need to gain the United States 45Q tax exemption, as Ben mentioned before. The 45Q gives the company $180 per ton of CO2 sequestered. This figure is expected to increase to $225 in 2025. Therefore, every company that produces emissions can benefit from a 45Q tax exemption. 
In a time where switching costs to renewable energy alternatives for companies, think airlines, supply like Amazon and otherwise, CDRs can allow companies to attain 45Q tax exemptions without investing major amounts of capital into reworking their already existing projections facilities to be green. Also, CDRs are a one-time purchase for companies, so companies will return to Oxy to continue to purchase more CDRs. Oxy CDR price right now is $40 to $80. Therefore, for companies not buying CDRs is not economical. Luckily for Oxy, they are a first mover in this rapidly developing CDR market, where demand for CDRs will only be more incentivized and demanded by specific industries. Looking at incentivization, internationally, ADNOC, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, and Occidental have joined forces to create DAX in the UAE. DAX are very expensive and take over three years to build. So with the demand for CDRs now, Oxy being a first mover gives them a major leg up. Pre-market CDR sales expose a large total adjustable market for Oxy. Around a million CDRs have been pre-sold with notable companies such as Amazon, Airbus, United, the Houston Texans, and the TD Group purchasing credits. The diversity of airline companies, sports teams, product companies, and banks purchasing CDR supports our large projected total adjustable market. On a sentiment note, these pre-market CDR sales show companies demonstrating interest in climate ventures, which will only become more important as they aim to reach COP28 goals. To validate our claims on CDR sales influencing our model, we used the polynomial regression to model CDR growth as well as our projected revenue growth. We found their Pearson's correlation coefficient to be 0.954, which indicates standardized industry-wide CDR sales positively correlate with our projections. Overall, the upsides from DAC revenues are unknown. We conclude that government incentivization internationally and a growing TAM of carbon credit consumers in all industries lead to a major upside for Oxy. Thank you, Maddie. Our third thesis point revolves around the correlation between oil futures and Oxy's share price and how that, cor uh, how that correlation suggests that Oxy will benefit from current geopolitical tensions. As you can see in that graph on the top left, there is an empirical correlation between the prices of oil futures using uh, WTI US futures prices and the Oxy share price. So Oxy here is shown in the navy and the futures price is shown in the light blue. This correlation is the result of a correlation between futures prices and oil stock prices, which a 2009 study from the University of Richmond found was strongest, specifically in times of economic uncertainty. Thus, if we can predict an increase in oil futures prices, um, it would also prompt an increase in the Oxy share price, especially when that growth is driven by economic uncertainty. We believe that current geopolitical tensions, specifically in the Middle East, will offer this sort of uncertainty-driven growth. Based on statements from Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdallahian, Iran's, uh, Iran's involvement in the Israel-Palestine conflict is becoming increasingly more probable, with de-escalation, as he says, unlikely. We believe that Iran's involvement in the war will trigger increases in these U.S. oil futures prices, as occurred during a very similar conflict in Ukraine. So by analyzing the effects of the Ukraine conflict, we can predict what's going to happen with this conflict. Ukraine and Russia combined hold only 4.8% of oil reserves, while Iran holds nearly double that with 9.5%. According to an article published in Nature, 70.72% of volatility in oil futures prices was attributed directly to the Ukraine conflict, and this conflict itself drove U.S. oil futures to increase by 52.33% in value. Given that so much more of the world's oil is in Iran, a conflict in Iran would prompt even more growth in futures prices than the Ukraine conflict did, while offering that same sort of economic volatility that correlates the Oxy share price with the U.S. oil price. And while oil prices are more of an industry-wide trend, we believe that Oxy will capture a disproportionately large share of these benefits compared to their competitors. Oxy has stated its plans to reinvest revenue from its renewable energy back into oil and gas segments, while competitors are doing the opposite by divesting their oil gas and focusing more on renewables. Thus, Oxy is positioning itself quite well to fully benefit from these increases, without the full volatility of just investing in oil as a commodity or the lost revenue potential from divesting oil and gas segments like their competitors. All right, guys, you're already one Great, minute over, you, so wrap it up quick. So for the technical side of this pitch, we conducted a full discounted cash flow valuation model alongside a comparable company's analysis. If you have any questions about how these numbers were uh, calculated, I'd be happy to answer them in the Q&A section. But right now, I'll just mainly be highlighting the key assumptions and projections that were used for the model. 
The growth rate for oil and gas segment came from the meteorological indic indicator calculation from a previous slide. And then in terms of the other segments, due to the intrinsic volatility of the oil industry, we wanted to have these projections be quite conservative. So nearly all percentage of revenue, percentage of COGS, and percentage growth metrics were straight lined as followed by sell side. In the cash flow build and leverage ratios, we found the most significant leverage ratio to be debt over EBITDA. This is because the oil industry is very CapEx intensive, thus causing a significant investment in physical assets. The accepted threshold of a good debt to EBITDA leverage ratio in the oil industry is below a 0.9, so in all our projections, we were excited to see less than 0.6. Here we have provided our full working capital schedule. We found it a crucial measure of the company's operational efficiency and its short-term financial health. Again, days receivable and payable were straight-lined as followed by sell side. This is because due to the operational changes of the DAX segment, we wanted to ensure the liquidity of the company. Similarly, days payable, which measures how long it takes the company to pay its suppliers, were straight-lined. Here we have the final DCF. The most important takeaways here are the price target calculation, as well as the possible adjustments with the sensitivity table. You can see that even in the most conservative cases, the price target is quite high. This is supported by the comps analysis, which showcases the oxy as within the median for EV EBITDA, but well above the bull case for PE ratio. A company with a significant amount of debt relative to equity might have a lower EV to EBITDA ratio due to higher enterprise value, but a higher PE ratio since the earnings are spread over a small equity base. As we learned earlier from the debt to EBITDA leverage ratio, we know that oxy will not have trouble paying off their debt, thus making this an ideal investment with high profitability. Moving, going quickly over our catalyst, Oxy's DAC facilities, while well, Oxy adapted new markets while cutting down its oil investments, Oxy's carbon removal credits signify new lines of business in an increasingly government-centivized industry. Already talked about the million dollars pre-sold CDRs leading to much more. Finally, the tensions within the Middle East and Russian conflicts will increase the demand for U.S. oil, where Oxy will dominate. As for our risks and mitigants, we'd be happy to discuss these in a little bit more depth in Q&A, but for the sake of brevity, our risks and mitigants generally fit into two categories. So first, we have the risk that oil production becomes increasingly difficult to operate, primarily because of existing oil reserves drying up. And while we know that this will eventually happen, the rate of oil consumption has also been thoroughly modeled and can be predicted based on rates of oil harvesting. So because of this, we don't believe that this is something that will ever just take Oxy by surprise. Um, furthermore, Oxy's reserves, specifically in the Permian Basin, are not predicted to dry up during our three to five year investment horizon. So the inevitable future impacts should not inv uh, impact our investment during this timeline. The second group of risks that we want to look at are risks that Oxy's technology becomes less lucrative. This is especially um, targeting the DAC business, uh, where new technology is being constantly developed by the competitors. However, the time it takes for these new technologies to actually reach market is quite long. Even Oxy's DAC took a few years uh, from 2019 to 2024 to be fully released to market. So expecting that other technologies also have this sort of five-year delay, it's unlikely that any of these technologies, A, are completed, but B, then have time to reach market within a three to five-year investment horizon. And lastly, as for the risk that the government stops in, uh, incentivizing green energy through these 45 Qs, we don't believe that this will be an issue over the next three to five years because the next election cycle will either preserve the current executive administration, which increased the benefits of 45 Qs over the last four years, or reinstate President Donald Trump, who was the president who had originally introduced 45 Qs in the first place. Thank you. All right, uh, you guys are six minutes over, so we'll could take like one question, maybe two. Do you mind if I take it? Go ahead, Alec. Okay. All right, um, so just a quick question. I know you guys touched on the uh, the, the Crown Rock um, acquisition a bit. Um, what are your levels of concern with kind of the, the your price target on the equity, given they've been willing to um, basically fund some of these acquisitions with uh, basically equity as opposed to doing it via debt? I think the Crown Rock deal is definitely something that we looked into, but we've added it into our model. But dealing with that, we look at the qualitative issues of it just adding in more net acres and the shale business rather than the means of which we're purchasing it. And when we're evaluating and projecting out to the long run, we're really looking more towards what the CDRs will do for the company rather than the acquisitions of getting more space. Got it. So I, I guess my question was almost in terms of like basically dilution in terms of shares, given they, they're issuing common stock to fund the acquisition. It, are you 
have you basically limited any of your upside potential based upon the acquisition given shares have been diluted since that point? Yeah, so um, in our inherent valuation, we were focused more on company valuation, implied valuation of the, the company itself, a dilution of ownership, market perception, like a complex valuation because of the acquisition of, of Crown Rock will definitely all play a role into how the Oxy can continue going forward. However, even the most conservative sell side models where they ac account for this acquisition, we see it being quite a bullish case. And then with our implied understanding of the direct air capture technology, we also see Oxy itself inherently growing as a company. So we see the most potential coming out of Oxy as a company, regardless of how dilution of ownership impacts share price. We know that even regardless of this, because of the very high implied upside, the dilution of shares will account for this and we'll still see quite a bullish case. Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks, guys. Awesome. So uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to pitch a long position for Janus International Group today. My name is Dylan Kang, and I'm joined by my uh, team, Julian, Drew, and Philip. So let's begin. So Janus International is a hidden gem in the self-storage market that IPO'd in June 2021 and experienced accelerated derating into 2022 before most recently gaining some traction. Janus holds a dominant 60 to 70% market share in the self-storage space with a robust value proposition, premium pricing power, and strategic acquisitions. The accelerating adoption of Janus's proprietary Noki smart access system, coupled with strategic expansion from its construction of a manufacturing plant in Poland, positions Janus to effectively capture the growing European market and benefit from organic growth in the United States. Despite short-term volatilities, Janus's resilience and growth drivers are poised to catalyze a market reevaluation in the industry as the industry currently misunderstands cyclicality. Janus boasts a strong 170% free cash flow conversion, underlining its strong cash generation capabilities and ability to rapidly deleverage themselves from M&A opportunities. Despite recent adjustments in market value, Janus still trades below its all-time high and at a 25% multiple discount to peers, despite being the only premium full service provider offering an attractive entry point for investors. As the market leader in providing self-storage equipment and solutions for operators worldwide, with 93% of its revenue coming from North America and 7% international, Janus International Group is comprised of three businesses. R3, Renovate, Rebuild, Replace, which makes up 31% of its revenue and focuses on modernizing and repairing existing storage units. Next is New Construction, which makes up 37.6% of revenues and focuses on planning, manufacturing, and installation of storage facility components. And lastly, commercial doors, which makes up 31.4% of revenues and allows Janus to produce and supply rolling and sheet doors for warehouses, barns, garages, and similar facilities. Now I'm passing it off to Philip for an industry overview. Self storage is a highly fragmented industry in the US, both in terms of suppliers and customers. In terms of customers, non-institutional REITs and institutional REITs control about 65% of the market with the rest being large self-storage providers like Public Storage and U-Haul. As mentioned, JBI is the market leader and, according to our research, could be considered the only full service provider in this expanding industry, expected to grow at a CAGR of 4.4% to $72 billion in 2029. Capacity utilization is at an all-time high of 95%, and providers are rushing to build more quality operations, especially in Europe, where only 6% of the population currently use self-storage and many don't have access at all. The industry is highly defensive and non-cyclical, as shown by the fact that self-storage REITs gained 5% in 2008, while other REITs posted negative returns, including dividends of 37.3% on average due to the housing crisis. Ongoing housing trends of downsizing due to rising rents and limited space in highly urban areas are some of the key drivers of industry growth. 
For example, in 1988, only 2.7% of Americans used self-storage, compared with a quarter of Americans having used self-storage at some point nowadays. We believe JBI's free pillar strategy allows it to benefit disproportionately from industry dynamics. With 60% of facilities being over 20 years or older, the street assumes Janus's R3 segment will be a key growth driver, as the company can provide many value-adding components, such as the smart lock entry system Noki and the security provider subsidiary ACT, that non-specialized competitor, competitors simply can't. This aligns with trends such as millennials seeking automated access and digital communication with operators. Furthermore, new construction will provide growth opportunities, primarily based on conversions of big box retail spaces and commercial space in urban areas to self-storage facilities. I'm now passing it on to my colleague, Drew. Thank you so much, Philip. Um, now I wanna shift the discussion to how Genesis unique value prop drives market share growth and consistently high margins. So let's start with a case scenario. You're a self-storage operator and you want to build more units or modernize old ones. Um, would you rather go to a small local supplier that usually has late delivery times and won't even provide value-added services? Or would you go to Janus, which has a network of over 140 GCs around the country and provides free value-added across the whole project lifecycle? Well, I guess here's your answer. Janus is such a great company, we believe, with a near monopoly in the self-storage industry because of its position in the value chain. Um, doors and locks represent only 5-10% to of a total project cost, yet you can't sell a unit without these. So the mission criticality, in addition to the small percentage of the total project costs, lend themselves to pricing power. So we see Janus benefiting from consolidation of the self-storage market into the hands of large institutions because of the value-added services and the superior reliability, 20 plus years of relationships. So, so why, does, why this does this opportunity exist? First is a rotation in shareholder base. In February 2018, Clear Lake acquired Janus and became its largest shareholder, even until when Janus IPO'd in 2021. Under their partnership, Janus completed several accretive activities, including the purchase of seven acquisitions and the development of new access control technology. This sell-off, however, since the IPO, Clearlake has gradually reduced ownership through block trades from 53 million shares to 22 million. And the sell-off has put short-term pressure on the share price. And this shift in shareholder base presents an opportunity for investors to capitalize on Janus's strong fundamentals at a discount. This value dislocation has been furthered by management's early blunders when Janus's EBITDA guidance missed in 21 and attracted scrutiny from the street. But now Janus has been um, posting conservative guidance in 2022 and 2023. And the lack of discussion on sell side reports indicates that these low growth guidance are skewing the street's projections of the business. Awesome. So now let's shift towards the outlooks for the various segments. So on one hand, self storage, um, the market more or less is pricing in the projected growth. Um, so we estimate a $8.1 billion opportunity across all of Genesis self-storage channels. Um, R3, which is the biggest um, portion of this, TAM, is Genesis specialty. So we think that they'll capture an outsized portion of this segment. And new construction, both REIT and not REIT owned, also contribute to a significant portion. And as for Genesis commercial segment, um, They've hardly penetrated this $4 billion market at only 10% market share. So we think that continued acquisitions in this space are necessary to tap into new end markets and lift this market share up. And this opportunity is not necessarily priced in by the market, um, as we found in our research.
So for our first thesis, the street currently is opting for an overly simplistic explanation by considering the driver of self-storage demand to be housing starts. With, exp with expectations of housing starts to drop, as shown from the sell side quotes, this is adversely affecting the street's outlook on Janus as top line growth aligns with management's conservative guidance of roughly four to six percent under the assumption of declining occupancy levels, which is currently floating at around 92 percent above the 85 percent historical levels. However, the cyclical nature that is being priced into Janus because of the street's fixation on housing starts and self storage demand is fundamentally flawed, as shown in the graph with the weak correlation between percent change in occupancy as a proxy for self-storage demand, as well as new housing starts. Instead, demand for self-storage is non-cyclical, being driven by the six Ds, which are life events that happen regardless of macroeconomic conditions. In fact, during the global pandemic, the self-storage industry sustained occupancy rates 10% higher than the historical average, and these levels have continued and throughout, well throughout 2023, even after the supposed COVID tailwinds were, were dissipating. In the bottom right graph, the dip for Janus in 2019 is not consistent with the market's understanding of cyclicality as the U.S. experienced near all-time high levels of housing starts with 1.54 million in December 2019 alone. Then, when the pandemic arose, Janus grew across segments, but especially commercial, where the fragmented um, customer base represents a breadth of customers from hospitals, hotels, stores, and individual homeowners. The Pandemic spurred life events for a steady 8, 93 to 95% occupancy rate during late 2021 into 2023, even as COVID subsided, demonstrating the non cyclical demand for self storage that will remain resilient post COVID. In fact, since 2017, occupancy levels have been floating above 90%, even despite a global pandemic and fluctuations in housing starts. Thank you, Dylan. And Dinoki Smart Entry System. All right, so building on to thesis one, um, not only is the industry as a whole understood by the misunderstood by the market, but Janice's incredible business quality seems to be misunderstood and clearly it is undercovered by Wall Street. So Janice is currently trading at a at an eight point four x multiple, which is on par with a low margin industrial company. And considering its stellar business quality, we think, that it, it should be trading more in the 10 to 12 X range. Um, and the Wall Street currently projects 4% growth for the next two years. And this is a byproduct in my opinion of the really appallingly low coverage it receives. Um, so compared to one of its competitors, um, yeah, it, it's very low coverage. Sorry, thank you, Drew. The Noki Smart Entry System by JBI is a wireless cloud-based digital key management solution that allows tenants entry to the facility using only a smartphone. The app allows operators to gain valuable data and fully automate the onboarding process of self-storage facilities, which is especially important as 17% of storage unit tenants leave within three months. Noki monitors and records data via motion sensors allowing operators to cut labor expenses by anticipating peak hours in advance and providing enhanced security features to customers. As you can see on our Google Trends search, smart locks have grown significantly in popularity and operators in Tigus reports find them to provide customers convenience and safety reassurance. Due to potential correlation, we also check this interest in smart locks against self-storage popularity, which seems to be uncorrelated. We believe that in expanding European markets, uh, Noki provides value as a higher minimum wage, for example, about $14 in Germany, and labor loss translate to increased labor expenses, profoundly cutting into margins for smaller facilities in urban areas. Noki is just one example of JBI's strategic M&A activity. The company has closed nine transactions in 2016, offering a suite of value-enhancing uh, components. This mitigates risk for self-storage facilities that do not want to deal with supply chain problems poised to occur by having multiple suppliers. The company owns subsidiaries specializing in commercial doors, security, IT, and production automation. These synergies give Janus a competitive advantage on customers already willing to pay a markup for aligned integrated technology. However, Janus's own operations are still growing strongly, 
of a revenue compounded annual growth rate of 21% from 2016 to 2021, 13% was still organic. I'm now going to pass it on to Dylan. Thanks, Philip. So moving on, we believe Noki adds significant value to each segment of the value chain from operators to customers. For, firstly, for operators, labor is typically the number one, number two cost, and Noki can really help with that. For example, instead of operators having to go there, have their employees go there and remove an open lock for customers, Noki significantly improves the customer integration and onboarding process when they move into facilities by removing the need for operators to have employees around the clock. For customers, not only does it seamlessly integrate with their workflow, but the value of increased security is very attractive, especially in Europe. Any customer can just buy a $10 padlock, but if someone wants to break in, they just have to buy a $15 pair of bolts, and the owner would not know until an employee detects it. This model has existed for decades, and Noki's compelling value proposition in security is supported when operators reported 80% fewer break-in claims on smart units versus traditional units. For Outlook, we believe smart entry systems are the future of the industry and that facilities without them will become functionally obsolete in the next 10 years. We thought of it like a game theory rationale for Noki adoption. New facilities with smart entry could pose a threat to existing facilities. More than likely, Janus will just have these doors arrive with the Noki installed. With a calculated $5.5 billion TAM for Noki, management is currently operating under a 1% adoption rate, and Cellside is similarly pricing in a 1% adoption projection. However, this is mathematically flawed as Noki saw 50% growth in 2023 with now 255k total installations by Q3 23, which equates to roughly a 1.16% adoption rate already ahead of their runway projection. Management continues to, to sandbag their guidance, yet the street remains aligned with the adoption rate um, because of fears of industry headwinds and declining demand and self-storage in the U.S. However, there are several factors that are, are working in Noki's favor for rapid adoption, including institutioners, institutional investors being well capitalized and well funded to take advantage of Noki in the U.S., making up a roughly 80% of the U.S. market. Therefore, we applied higher adoption rates in our graph that illustrates the Noki revenue opportunity combined with the high upside from upcharging customers as demonstrated by the case study. All right, y'all are over time. Our so third let's thesis wrap it focuses up. on the development of new plants abroad, specifically and in, in Europe, and how this will boost market penetration for Janus, especially since there has been no significant coverage of this by the street. With the construction and opening of the Poland plant, Janus is able to capture more market share by expanding production capacity while also reducing lead times with a total of two factories instead of one. Also, with the current construction backlog of new facility, facilities, focusing on 21% and 10% with, with awaiting approval and planning approved, as well as preferences among operators shifting towards unmanned access after hours and electronic locking system, Janus's products are direct, directly in demand by customers and operators. Additionally, it's important to remember Europe is still very underpenetrated. For example, the UK, which is the most developed market in Europe, is still 13 times smaller than the US in terms of square foot per capita. It's also important to note that Janus has bought most of their competitors for self-storage doors. In Europe, they don't have a lot of competition, giving Janus a, Janus a pricing power advantage. Low competition equates to operators having trouble and having delays in opening because they can't get partitioning to perform the redevelopment. Therefore, being the largest supplier of partitioning in Europe, Janus must meet their demand and is the ultimate reason for opening the Poland plant in addition to the UK plant, again, helping see speed up the delivery times and improve on costs. Additionally, Janus provides greater reliability and higher quality against its small local competitors in Europe, apparent with multiple operators like Sugar explicitly stating their preferences for Janus. According to our calculation, the Poland plant would generate approximately $25 million in revenue for 2024, which is an increase in revenues by 38% from 2023 levels for the international segment. Additionally, we project revenues for the Poland plant to reach $68 million by 2028 after Janus improves operational synergies. This is factoring in our calculations for Janus's European market penetration based solely on the countries which the UK plant supplies, which is on average 5.74%, a lack of differences between consumer behavior in the US and Europe, and CAGR growth rates derived from industry research reports. At, as for our risk and mitigants, we focus on highlighting some of the following. 
Volatile steel prices could diminish margins as it accounts for 70% of COGS and misconceptions among the market that are increasing market rates will dampen self-storage industry growth, decreasing overall investment. And it appears as if we're pretty low on time. So I'll, I'll just show our appendix. So here are our case assumptions as well as our sensitivity table at the bottom. And here are our summarized financials. All right, thanks guys. Um, now um, we'd like to open up the floor for any questions. Um, thanks for listening and considering our pitch. Um, Al, do you want to go or should I go? Uh, you can lead off. I'll go second. So how'd you find this? Does somebody work in the storage business or like it's a, it's a small company. It's pretty unusual. Uh, yeah, so it's a really small company, but basically when we were doing our research, we decided to go on a couple of forums and this happened to be one of the companies that stood out to us and that, that also lacked coverage and posed a challenge, but a great challenge for us. So this is, is essentially why we chose this company. I can, yeah, I guess. So, so yeah, go uh, ahead. Uh, yeah, so I guess my question comes down to it. Sounds, so it looks like basically 92.5% of their, their common stock is outstanding right now. If if we believe that the uh, there's basically an information asymmetry and that's kind of what's leading to the stock being undervalued, why wouldn't uh, Janus put more effort into basically buying back some of the common stock if they believe it's at too low of a price? Yeah, um, we actually came across that in our research. So Clear Lake, um, as of last week, they've totally exited their investment. And we actually kind of think management kind of blundered. They could have bought back shares for relatively cheap. Um, so we think going forward, buybacks will be a great way to deploy capital um, in addition to some of the acquisitions. And also, like, it's hard to continue, like, such a great streak of value creative ac acquisition. So buybacks we see as a great deployment of capital in the future. Okay. And then just as a follow-up, I know you basically described this company as a near monopoly. Do you see, do you anticipate any issues with them continuing to acquire firms at the, the rate they have been without uh, basically government stepping in? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> so in the U S they're currently uh, boasting a market share of roughly 50%. And a lot of their, uh, a lot of their competition regarding the U.S. are a lot of these regional players who are definitely still considered competition, and especially in regards to Noki. The key advantage that the uh, Janus has in the U.S., and I, we don't think, because even though it, it is a proprietary technology, there's still a lot of companies rolling out similar products like Noki, but Janus's main um, competitive advantage is the data that they are collecting, and so they can shift Noki and upgrade it based off of this new data that a lot of these companies don't have because of the lack of adoption. And so Janus has this first mover advantage. And then moving on to Europe, and the European market is extremely fragmented. And Janus is in a very good position based off its legacy operations to seize a lot of this growth and uh, self-storage in Europe. Uh, we read a couple of reports of uh, the largest self-storage uh, self operators, and they explicitly stated their likeliness of Janus's products. It was just the lack of supply. So the demand is definitely there, and it's just a matter of how much capital will Janus allocate to the emerging market in Europe. And we definitely see them actually take steps to this by creating the Poland plant, which was just finished in December of 2023. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, Drew's no, if you don't have I'm, I'm struggling with the story because I've used like self storage and then like it wasn't electronic. It was just like a kind of a garage door and I brought my own padlock. And, um, but you're, you're kind of, it sounds like you're kind of, picture I'm getting is it's kind of a roll up of, of, of some providers to the self storage industry. And you feel like it's established like a monopoly position and you feel like there's going to be a lot of growth in this, in the, in the adoption of the electronic like locking is that is like, like, can you walk me through the story kind of in those kind of terms and then show me like, like where, where, where it has like, like, is this an excellent business that has like amazing margins 
and where there's going to be growth, you know, over time? Um, I could also take this question. So regarding Janus, we've obviously seen them take a lot of accretive um, inorganic uh, growth in the past. And for the future, we see a lot of organic growth for them for, for several reasons. Um, one, obviously, they're the only full service provider. And there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, industry re-rating that we see coming forward. And so Janus is in a very a unique position to capture a lot of this alpha because unlike their competitors that have inferior products mm -hmm. and also don't have don't share the same end markets as them Janus actually has a extremely fragmented end market with their top 10 customers representing only 20% of their revenue and so addressing your question about you know Nokia adoption this is a product that is still rolling out significantly and just last semester that just last sem uh sorry not semester a year experienced 50% growth but was only starting to get embedded since 2022 even though they acquired it in 2018 and so um, that's our perspective on the Nokia adoption. We see a, a growth runway significant in Europe, and we see this misunderstood cyclicality of the demand for self-storage to really help propel organic growth for the future. Is there any recurring revenue? Like once they, because it seems like a cyclical business. It's, it seems like a niche provider of capital equipment when somebody builds a, out a self-storage facility it seems pretty cyclical. Is there some? Is there a is there a recurring revenue story? Yes. So there is a recurring revenue story, especially with Noki. Um, they get roughly they get roughly eight dollars a unit um, for no, each installation of Noki, and obviously we see a lot of installations growing Back in up, the like US. So eight dollars per unit, like when they build the unit. So it's eight dollars each year for each installation each that they have to pay because mm -hmm. it's electronic and there's gotcha. software embedded within mm -hmm. it that's constantly being updated. But yes, interesting. All right. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting story. If like this thing takes over and you take something that was a capital, you know, cyclical capital equipment kind of thing and make it kind of a SaaS thing where you get a, uh, you can get a cut you know, based on providing like data and value. I mean, that's, there's something interesting there maybe. Yeah. So with Noki and uh, the European segment as well, um, one of the, the largest self-store operators, so Janus's customers in Europe actually stated, you know, they understand the value proposition for Noki. It's just a matter of fact that they want to see it succeed first in the United States. And obviously, we're seeing that significant growth in 2023. New installations with just a recent announcement earlier this year across uh, one of the largest um, operators in um, the U.S., rolling it out across all of its facilities. And so... We expect that in 2024, a lot of these European operators will start to accelerate adoption as well. Could you see private equity taking an interest in something like this? Uh, definitely. Uh, with something that we found was that a lot of uh, PE firms were buying out smaller operators. So I think as like PE firms like BlackRock, I mean, Blackstone, uh, acquire more like smaller operators when they are doing the refurbishment, which is a part of uh, Janus's R3 business. They'll want to have this new technology uh, within their facilities. So just, and that was something that we met, mentioned in our risk and mitigants, the consolidation of the industry. But then again, it also benefits Janus in a way because again, Noki is a part of something that they will implement when they're refurbishing these new facilities. So I definitely think like priv private equity firms will like this new technology within their storage facilities. All right. I think we're going to wrap it up now. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, Thanks to the last team for showing up. And thank you all the participants and all the viewers for, for showing up this afternoon. Uh, hope, uh, hope it was entertaining for you all. Uh, and yeah, thanks.